Welcome to Perceptions Today podcast, where we discuss consciousness in all forms. December 2021, Episode 5, Anthony Peake's Roundtable with the Public, Part 5 of 7. He is a writer who deals with the borderline areas of human consciousness. What Anthony just spoke about, uh, the, the, that this problem is the heart of the, the, it's the heart problem. It's basically the biggest problem that the scientists are going through. So uh, there's a scientist at the University of Oxford. His name is Professor Jewell. So he's working on this problem. So I had a few sessions with him uh, just around uh, a month ago. And he explained to me the entire, uh, the entire process of working on this. And he's, he has a, a team of 15 people who are working on this. So let's hope they get a, a breakthrough. Wow. This is an instance of the conversation coming up in the roundtable discussion. Participants knew it was being recorded. Just like when I was talking about my hypnagogic experiences, where you have glimpses. I had a hypnagogic this morning. Last night. When I was just looking at a street. I got a I just remembered it now, and it's sort of Victorian times. And people walking down the street in Victorian times. And it's just a a glimpse of something. And I think it's just because our brains are tuned into the greater informational field that is out there. And again, a few years ago, I wrote a book with Professor Irvin Laszlo. And Laszlo and I argue that there is the information field, which we believe is is what's called the zero point field, um, which is the form of energy that exists at the zero point, which effectively is is at absolute zero, Um, you know, which which is 273.17 degrees Celsius, I think. Um, And there should be should be no energy there, but they discover that there is. And I believe that we can attune into that under certain circumstances. So, Gabe, that was a really fascinating observation. Thank you for that. I have to yeah. say before we go, sorry, Gabe, I thought okay. sometimes <laughs> I do this to you. Sometimes you do it to me. We're all OK, I think, aren't we? <laughs> sorry. No, I just wanted to my, my final thought on it is uh, my my longest phrase that I heard upon waking. And this is totally with my earplugs in my ear was a phrase that was kind of deep. It said, know the hearts of the ones you love. And I'll end with that. Wow. That's really amazing. Wow. Yeah. I have to say today is just so much information and people are just giving me messages saying how great it is. Renegade has sent me a message to send to yourself, Anthony, which I've sent to you in a direct message saying just the content. He didn't really want to go back to work, which is, he just wanted to stay and listen. One thing that I did find, on Tuesday we were talking, obviously, the KR Central film, which you did about the internal light, and Dostoevsky. And on Sunday night on BBC Radio 4 Extra, they've done an interpretation of Dostoevsky's The Double, but set it in the future. And it's an hour-long play, which Mm. they've done, which I thought was quite interesting to find. So if you go to either Saturday night or Sunday morning at midnight on the BBC Sound schedule, you'll find that it's called The Double. So I'm unfortunately going to butcher your name. I think it's Can I just, Monster- just come in there? Sure. Just a very quick observation there. That again, coming back to earlier on, I was talking about Dostoevsky and his temporal lobe epilepsy. That is why Dostoevsky was preoccupied with doubles, because of his, he wrote the double because his TLE was allowing him access to the daemon and that's why he felt he, he was he needed to write the book the, do, uh, the novel the double that's great i'm gonna hopefully get your name right is it moza awesome. yeah it's more it's more can i find out where you are in the world because that'd be great yeah uh, i'm from okay, Pakistan. Right. sorry for butchering your name if i do sorry go ahead and introduce no, yourself right. please Okay, so I'm a 21 year old studying psychology um, uh, from uh, University of Nottingham. So uh, my country of residence is uh, Pakistan, but right now I live in Nottingham and I'm studying there in University of Nottingham studying psychology. So uh, the uh, the thing that I want to talk about is that while I I'm a student of psychology, so I've uh, uh, studied about the voices that people hear and also the the hypnosis that they, they go through and uh, all types of imaginations they go through the mind and then they see their see those realities in reality in 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 their own lives so uh, the basic thing behind this concept is that it's it all depends about the cognition of the person so what you imagine and you keep imagining that thing 
And when you see that, uh, it, because it, it, that thing goes on in your mind, and when you see that somewhere, it becomes a reality. You see, uh, uh, it like just like Gabe spoke about, or I don't know if the Anthony sp- spoke about, you see an f- empty street and you see those those things there. So it has to do with the, cogn- the cognition of a person. So like uh, I want to say, talk about uh, the, my, my experience on this. So my experience on this is that uh, when uh, while I'm dreaming, I hear a lot of things in the dream. So when I wake up, I keep hearing those. Although I'm awake, I keep hearing the same voices. So it has to do with the in, with the inside of a person, how they perceive things, how they see things overall. So these are my two cents on the overall overall voices and things that people hear as a psychologist. Yeah, I think it's very important, isn't it, that um, double in terms of that. of the psychology right. of perception and how perception works within the brain. And probably as a psychology student, Mozam, you, you've probably come across the work of Richard L. Gregory, um, who was the, yeah, Gregory is yeah. one of my all time intellectual heroes. And his book on vision um, is extraordinary because it makes you realize just how extraordinary the process of seeing is and how it is that we can inwardly project of um, an interpretation of external reality. Uh, And I'll give an example of this is that we see because photons, which are tiny points of of energy, of electromagnetic energy, that can be a wave or a particle, but we're not gonna go there for now. Um, They hit the retina. um, And when they hit the retina, they're converted into an electrical signal, which is then transferred from the retina down the, um, the optic nerve past the optic chiasma um, and the image that's created or the, the, the stimulated image that's created from the photons on the retina is inverted and postage stamp sized. It is that image that is then converted into an electrical impulse, which is then reassembled in the darkest part of the brain, that is in the visual cortex right at the back of the brain. And it's reassembled into a three dimensional full color image that surrounds us, that we see. And yet that image is not, there is no one-to-one relationship between that image and the external reality that we think we're seeing. For instance, you look at something, the only reason you see something because photons are bouncing off it and the particular photons are of a particular frequency which makes the color red for for argument's sake. Um, But there is no red anywhere. Red doesn't exist anywhere. It's, uh, as you know, Mazim, it's called a qualia. So the... Yeah, uh, that's right. That's absolutely uh, correct. And so the biggest question is, isn't it, Mozam, is at the moment for psychologists and has been at least since 1995, it's called the hard problem of science. The easy problem of science is explaining how the brain functions, how the neurochemicals work, how the neurotransmitters react, how the synapses work, how uh, the communication between the neurons take place. We have a mechanistic model for that. What we don't have is even the first idea of how elect, uh, uh, um, chemicals reacting in, uh, in electrical fields create the concept of Mozam or Terry or Greybeard or Gabe to give us this kind of inner life where we have hopes and dreams and memories. And David Chalmers, uh, uh, an Australian psychologist, uh, philosopher, turned around and said, this is the hard problem of science. How do we create, how does the sense of self get created within the brain? And this is one of the greatest mysteries of science. And until science can explain that, as well as explaining the mechanisms by which the brain functions, we don't, we will only start to begin to have answers. But Mozam, that was fascinating. Thank you so much and welcome. It's really good. Uh, yeah, you're, you're I would welcome. say, Mazam, okay, if you so, want to be part of the community, yeah. follow either the account or Centred Awareness and also, of course, Anthony Peak. And we do have regular talks on different subjects that you might actually fancy popping along to and participating in because it's a sharing environment. And we will link you to other communities as we interlope quite a lot of the research. I think my teeth are falling out. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. I'll definitely... That's great. So I have just one last thing to say. Shall I go ahead? 
if it's a brief to. one, because I have only with this hand up for a yeah, while. It's a, yeah, it's, sure. a, it's, a, it's a brief one. It's a, what Anthony just spoke about, uh, the, the, that this problem is the heart of the, the, it's the heart problem. It's basically the biggest problem that the scientists are going through. So uh, there's a scientist at the University of Oxford. His name is Professor Jewell. So he's working on this problem. So I had a few sessions with him uh, just around a, a month ago. And he explained to me the entire uh, the entire process of working on this. And he's he has a, a team of 15 people who are working on this. So let's hope they get a, a breakthrough. Wow. That is fan- that is fantastic, Mozam. If you can, if you can, probably message me about the details of that. I'd be really, really interested to know about that. That sounds a very exciting. Li- that's great news, isn't it? Effectively, you know, it's been taken seriously. Yeah, fantastic. Definitely. Thank you definitely so much. Keep us in the loop because Thank it's you. amazing how much the synchronicities are falling in. Because if Anthony hadn't have decided to volunteer his time for this afternoon, none of us would have been connected to actually hear the information that you've just passed on to us. That's not an issue. You guys are welcome. And because I heard a lot of stories from you guys as well, like Anthony and Gabe. That inspires me. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say so. Oni, if you'd like to ask your question. Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, basically, my question is based on uh, uh, memory, in a way, in kind of... Uh, Years ago, like I happened to be like busy, I think a stage of uh, uh, 10 or 12 years or somewhere there. And uh, I was like for- forgetting things, like forgetting things, literally, like even small things. And this year, probably started last year, I started to remember everything like in bits and pieces. What what was the cause of it, basically, uh, in the mental state? And then my second question, I think, is uh, is towards uh, Mark. I will DM you uh, the question. Mark, uh, Mark spoke about something like astral bodies and kind of thing. I'm kind of quite interested in that as well. Anyway, thank you. Okay, well, the first one, memory is a fascinating thing. And again, Moazm will probably back me up on this one in that there's always been a great mystery that where, where is memory located in the brain? And in the 1960s, um, um, a guy called Carl Lashley did a series of experiments with rats whereby they taught rats to go through um, a maze. And then they extracted parts of the rat's brain And they found that however much bits of the brain were taken out, the rat would still manage to get through the maze, which Lashley, towards the end of his life, because he was looking for something called the engram, the the, the location of memory. And he came to the conclusion that memory was not located in any one part of the brain, but was located across the brain. And it was at parts of the brain reacting with each other. Now, we are aware that um, probably the amygdala, Um, probably may be involved in some way, which is close to the temporal lobes, um, in the sense that amygdala is very much the area of fear um, and of smell. So in which case, when you smell something, it seems to evoke memory straight away, doesn't it? You know, you smell something and it takes you right back to memory without you taking the intervening steps of thinking, well, you know, when did I last remember that? Now, one of Lashley's students was a guy called Carl Pribram, uh, and Pribram was at the University of Georgetown. And Pribram came up with a fascinating idea that he said, no, memory, memory is located all the way across the brain. And not only that, but it works holographically. And that there is a holographic principle going on here. Um, and that this would explain something, again, that psychologists are aware of, which is a huge problem to psychologists. It's called the binding problem. It's the idea of how we have a feeling of a simultaneity, how it is that I, my, my sight and my hearing and everything else works at the same time to give me a feeling of being here and now at this point in time, because it can't work that way, because different parts of the brain are processing different senses at diff- in different, at different parts of the brain, which they then have to communicate with each other. But the speed of communication across the brain, I think, is something like 144 feet per second, something. It's not extraordinarily fast. 
but we have the feeling that everything is happening now. And there's a wonderful experiment that is worth checking out, and it's the slamming of a car door. And it's, this is very intriguing, in that if, I think it's 60 feet away, if somebody slams a car door in front of you and it's less than 60 feet, you have a feeling that the door, the door closing and the sound happen at the same second, split second. Which is, if you think about it, is impossible because sound travels through the air at, what, 800 miles per second, 800, miles, 800 feet per second, whereas light travels 186,000 miles a second. So the light is hitting your eye far quicker than the sound waves arriving. But you have the feeling of simultaneity. And the belief is what happens is the brain buffers information, holds that information back until it has all the information. But more than 60 feet away, it doesn't bother. So you suddenly have the, you feel it, see the door slam. And then a split second later, you hear the sound. And this is intriguing because it means if the brain can buffer information, it means it's recording it. And if it's recording it, it means it's recording everything. In which case, are memories literally recordings of the things we have experienced in our past? If so, where are those recordings encoded? I would argue they're encoded holographically within the brain. And what are those recordings for? Well, I'd argue this explains the panoramic life review that people experience during near-death experiences. And again, in my cheating the ferryman hypothesis, we've already touched upon one element of the cheating the ferryman hypothesis, which is time dilation, subjective time dilation in dream states. The second point is how memories work and how memories can be evoked. Now, only one of the things you were saying about suddenly how these memories suddenly came back, I would argue the memories have never been lost. There was a guy called Wilder Penfield, who from the 1930s to the 1950s, he was a, an American neurosurgeon based in Canada, based in Montreal, I think. And Penfield did a series of experiments man, mapping the brain. And he used a tiny electrode. Uh, what they did was they had people who um, if you take the top of the skull off and somebody has a local anesthetic, you can stimulate the surface of the brain and they don't feel pain. So you can, by putting an electrode onto the brain, you can map what bits of the brain do what, the surface of the brain. And this is what Penfield did. But when he started putting the electrode onto the, uh, the temporal lobes, he was able to evoke three dimensional memories of past life. Literally, the person was back in their own past, re-experiencing the past. And at the end of his life, he made a statement and he said that as far as he was concerned, the human brain records every single event of your life. And those of you who were involved earlier on will know that I mentioned my Australian friend, Rebecca Sharrock. And Rebecca remembers every single event of her life. And that's because we all can. It's just that the circumstances are not right for us to do so. But under certain circumstances, those memories can be immediately evoked. It is a question of circumstances and how things can be made. But thank you, Oni. That was a fantastic question. Thank you. I have to say, Esther Tarek, when you're about to talk, there's two people that turned up. There's one listening who is a great friend of our community. Unfortunately, doesn't have a tablet stroke phone to get in. And her name is called Cosmic Librarian. She participates a lot with uh, interaction within her actual tweet atmosphere. And if you ever get the opportunity, I'll pass her into your direct messaging box. She is someone that when we get the opportunity to have an interview, whether it be on a Zoom call or something equivalent, there is so much information in her head and also experience and just fantastic. And after Esoteric, there is also another great friend of our community, this imaginal traveler who is an experiencer and also Kundalini experiencer, plus also an author and a musician who I think you should really talk to. Okay. Esoteric, take the floor. Hello again. Uh, sorry if I'm out of breath. I've been exercising while <laughs> listening to all this. Um, first of all, thank you. It's, it's been fantastic. You guys touched upon 11-11 synchronicities and a lot of other fascinating topics. I wonder if anyone here has experienced the uh, slider effect, the streetlight phenomenon effect. Um, that used to plague me quite a bit. 
and in different locations at different times of the night. So just wondering if anyone has any uh, experience on that aspect. Oh, we just lost Anthony. Okay, we'll just wait for a minute. Uh, at this point in time, does anybody need a slight break and come back in three minutes? Melissa, could you hold on to the fort for that? I just need to grab a drink. Yeah, not a problem. And obviously when Anthony comes back, he will be just a listener until I actually give him access. Oh, he's coming back already, but I will explain the situation. <laughs> I don't want to miss anything because obviously take headphones off, get there, come back again. Where are you, you now? Pods. That's good. Hang on one second. Yeah, well, I'm on wires so that it makes easy life. All right. I'm just sending you a co-host link now, Anthony. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a few seconds out to go and grab a drink, but I don't want to miss any of the conversation. So I'm going to allow you to just have a quick free for all. And then we have obviously Melissa wanted to say something before Imaginal Traveller. And oh, welcome Paranormal Blip. Haven't seen you for a while. Glad you could make it. And also good old Jeffrey. Nice to see you. And I also Moses as well. Again, Melissa, could you just take hold the fort for me yeah um anthony i might ask you my question really quickly um just going back to hearing voices and things like that it almost sounded like i'll, I'll give you one of my experiences so there was a time a time where i was giving someone a reading and it felt like all of a sudden from my right hand side someone standing very close to me um like an energy and almost to the point where I could sense that it was female and that she was looking over my shoulder and to the, it felt that strong that I had to kind of turn to my right and say, who's that? And as soon as I asked that question, I heard auntie. And I said to the person that I was reading, I've got an auntie here. And he said, yeah, it's my mum's sister. So is that, was that someone was that an entity or is it, was I, was that in my head? Was that myself hearing that voice? That is a billion dollar question and so important. And this is part of my latest research project. Um, I'm involved with two other researchers in trying to recreate something called the Philip experiment that took place in 1970 in Toronto. And in the Philip experiment, uh, a group of researchers created an entity. Um, literally, they, they created a story of a historical character called Philip Aylesford. Um, and they made out that he was uh, an English aristocrat living in Warwickshire in the centre of the UK in the 1680s. And he was an outsider because he was a Roman Catholic in a period where it was quite difficult to be Catholic in the UK after the English Civil War. And that he is in a loveless marriage and he fell in love with a gypsy girl and his wife found out, broke his heart and he killed himself. But all of this was fiction. They just made it up. But it started to manifest because they were interested in Ouija boards and why it was Ouija boards moved. And was it that people were deliberately trying to push the Ouija boards in certain ways? And what they then did was they then found that the entity started to manifest itself. And it started, it started initially with messages, then it started with rapping, and they got incredible rapping sounds. And then the table started to move. And in fact, if you go on to YouTube and look up the Philip experiment, you will find a TV program that um, they did in uh, Canadian television where the, the table actually moves in the studio live, uh, which was quite extraordinary. But the question they were asking was, you know, can, do we create these entities or are they external to ourselves? And I think in terms of your voice there, uh, I think this is part and parcel of what's happening with mediumship. And, it's, and I, I work with mediums a lot uh, and do a lot of research with mediums and a lot of my friends are mediums. And we debate this a lot, a lot is are we channeling actual dead people or are we channeling what uh, a guy called Joe Fisher in a famous book called The Hungry Ghosts, is that are they entities that are sort of anticipating our needs uh, and everything and fulfilling them because that's what we want to hear? Like, could it be that in some way you are actually telepathic and you are picking up 
the, your, your subject's anticipations of what she wanted to hear. But that doesn't necessarily explain the sensation you had of the sensed presence, which was we discussed earlier on, you know, the idea with um, Michael Persinger, the idea of sensing somebody standing there. And again, I was intrigued when you said it was your right side, which, which of course is your non-dominant left hemisphere, which again is intriguing as to why there is a sense presence and everything else as well. And what is the role of these entities? Now, again, um, um, one of the people that I'm doing the research with in terms of the Philip experiment is a young Canadian research by the name of Samantha Lee Treasure. And she's, she's doing a lot of research in non-standard ghosts. They, they are ghosts that are like cartoon characters. You know, these are, these are ghosts or, 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 or geometric shapes that people perceive. So there's something far greater going on here. We are, we're giving a very simplistic explanation for something I think that is far more interesting and as somebody said earlier, I'm far more impish. There seems to be almost this joke taking place, this leg pulling, you know, this kind of weird playing with us and playing with our anticipations. And that really, really, really intrigues me. And I think that, and I argue this, and I say this to people whenever we get together like this, we're all drawn together for a reason, guys. You know, this, this hasn't just happened by chance. This meeting together is because we collectively are going to create something extraordinary. And you guys are going to link in with my friends and the thousands of people that are involved in my work across the world. And you're going to be part of this greater group. And we collectively are creating, again, a term I used earlier on, an egregore. An egregore is a group, group dynamic that is greater than the individuals. And we're creating something absolutely extraordinary. And that's why I felt it was so important that we continued with this conversation this afternoon. And indeed, why we don't do this once a month, because we will draw more people in and together we might be able to come with solutions. We can all, it's like a huge Venn diagram, isn't it? We bring in our little bit of information and we share it with everybody else. And then everybody goes, do you know, I hadn't thought about that. And it stimulates their ideas. And that's what this is about. This is not about Anthony Peake. I'm nobody. It's not about me. It's much, much bigger than me. You know, and it's, it's the community we angle, do. isn't it, really? This is the thing. The whole point we set up Perceptions today was to be an egoless, egoless environment where we come share knowledge, even if it clashes with people, but not in an argumentative way, but it might provoke thought and other research avenues. And lucky enough, I'm oh, back so now with my drink. And that's the way okay, so that totally. this, this community is, this has is, worked. This is the important thing. We have to be open to other people's opinions because, and this is so important, all people have their opinions and belief systems. And I can say this as a sociologist, you know, a trained sociologist, that we have our belief systems because we have had experiences that have reinforced that belief system. Nobody just comes arbitrarily to believing in ghosts or arbitrarily believing in precognition. It's because we have experienced these things. And we know that they are genuine and real. So the question has to be, if they are genuine and real, what are they? What are they telling us about the greater reality? Now, there are more and more academics these days that are moving towards this. More, there's something called Hempel's Dilemma. And it's something I find particularly intriguing. And Hempel's Dilemma is that every society from the beginning of time has always believed that its science and its philosophy is the pinnacle of understanding of the true nature of reality. We feel this now. We, we feel that our scientists now say, oh, you know, we just know everything. And I'll give an example of just how bad this can be. In about 18, 1893, 94, I think it was, some of you will know of Mitchelson-Morley experiment, which was an experiment that took place in the 1890s to prove that the luminiferous ether didn't exist. Now, the luminiferous ether was something that was posited by scientists to explain how, um, how light can travel through a vacuum, how it is that light can travel from the sun through a vacuum to get to the earth without a medium to go through, which, which for them was impossible. So they came up with a concept called the luminiferous ether, which literally luminiferous means light carrying. So the luminiferous ether. So they did an experiment, which I won't go into now, but it was quite a, a clever experiment, which proved that the ether didn't exist. 
We now believe the ether probably does exist and it's called zero point energy, but that's something for another discussion. So one of them, the guys that did the experiment was a guy called Mitchelson. And in that year, he was opening up a new experimental laboratory at the University of Chicago. And he stood up and he said, and this is literally what he said. He said that science, we have now got to the point in science where we virtually know everything. All we will now be doing for the future is doing calculations to the sixth decimal point. That's all scientists will be doing. Now, talk about hubris, but this is what he said. But he did say there are only two dark shadows on the horizon. One is something called the electromagnet, uh, the electro, um, the uh, infrared. I think it was the infrared catastrophe. And it was to do with black bodies and black body radiation, which is quite a complex issue. But again, given time, uh, well, I do explain it in my books. and I might Can I just quickly later. pause you? Because something very interesting has just come in, which will fit right into talking about Ether. Cosmic okay. Librarian, who is running off a Mac and unfortunately doesn't have the equipment to get in, she was actually talking about, hopefully we get the right words here, Lumina Ferocious Ether last week she was tweeting about. Have you luminiferous heard of... ether. Luminiferous yeah. ether. Yeah, yes. that's exactly what. Yeah, it's luminiferous ether. This was the thing that Mitchell's, the Mitchelson Morley experiment disproved, um, which which is intriguing. So what he did was he stood up and he said about the six decimal point. He said there's only two things. One is the the the, the ultraviolet catastrophe to do with black body radiation. There's something called a photoelectric effect, which is if you shine light onto um, a surface, um, electrons get kicked out. It generates electricity and they didn't understand how that could possibly be but they were the only two things okay now what is really great about this story is that a few years before there was a young german guy who was about 17 or 18 and he couldn't make up his mind whether he wanted to be a musician or a physicist and he went to see his tutor and his tutor said the same thing as mitchelson said he said there's nothing really to discover in science so i if i were you i'd become a, a musician i'd become a pianist you're going to earn more money. That young man was a guy called Max Planck, or Max Planck, if you want to pronounce it in German. And in he was then subsequently employed at the turn of the last, last century, 1899, 1900, by the German government to try and make light bulbs more effective. And there were problems he was having with this work. And the only way he could come to the conclusion of the evidence he was discovering was that energy wasn't continual. Energy didn't, came in bits, or as he called them, quanta. And he stood up in December of 1900 in Berlin and made a speech and said, and this is the intriguing thing of what I was saying before. He turned around and he said, I don't know why this is true, but I just instinctively feel it is. And he even came up with what's called Planck's constant which was a mathematical structure that we've now found that happens everywhere in the universe that he made up. It was a random act, as he said, an act of desperation. This is why I argue we're creating the, the science, we're creating the environment around us. That speech started the quantum revolution. Remember, it was called quanta because it means package. That started the quantum revolution, changed everything also managed to explain black body radiation. So one of the, 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 the problems that Mitchelson talked about a few years before was explained, but it was explained by coming up with something so revolutionary and so different. And suddenly the whole of science, the whole of science as we understood it, we realized that there was so much of it that wasn't right. And then in 1905, in his great year, was Albert Einstein, who wrote three papers in 1905. And one of these papers explained black, uh, uh, the photoelectric effect. And he explained it by saying that light was made up of photons, which were tiny particles. Because up until then, they'd argued that light was a wave. But Einstein said light was a particle. But now we know that light is both a wave and a particle. It's a wave if it's not looked at, and it's a particle when it is measured or looked at. Now, this is extraordinary. And we are in the same position now when 94% of the universe is missing. 
It's made up of dark energy and dark matter. But we don't know what dark matter and dark energy is. We just know it's there. And we know it's there because the way in which um, galaxies rotate. There was a, a lady called Franklin who came up with the, the mathematics of looking because they revolve in the wrong way. The speed doesn't work. And the only reason they can explain it is there's something called dark matter. And then they discover this something called dark energy. So clearly, we don't know everything. We're far from it. We, Hempel's dilemma is quite correct. Our science still does not have the answers. And the things we've been talking about today, such as the hard problem of consciousness, these are the things that science has to address in order to understand. And I'll leave you with one final point on this. Did you know that the mathematics that is used to explain quantum physics doesn't work when it's used to explain cosmology? The two parts of reality, the very big and the very small, the maths does not work. They're working on completely different mathematical structures, and they haven't been able to bring those two together, and they still haven't. It's hubris. That's astounding. I have to say that I've, we've rolled into this. I forgot one thing which I should have been advertising and promoting for tomorrow before we get to Imaginal Traveller, as she is just fantastic to talk to. Tomorrow on UK time, 19th of October at 7 p.m., we're holding a discussion of six ways mushrooms can save the world, which was a TED talk presented on YouTube featuring Paul Stamets. So if you fancy coming along, obviously a schedule space will be publicized. And again, if you haven't, if you are new to our community, please follow us. Otherwise, you might, when we get bounced out, if the room collapses, hopefully it won't. Um, we'll be able to tweet out again. You'll be able to follow us very quickly, which is great. Now, I think, Imaginal Traveller, you've got the opportunity to have the floor and introduce yourself and anything else you'd like to say. Sorry, um, only, I think only had a question. Before yeah, before I've been saying that Imaginal Traveller could have spoken. Only he's had 20 questions. I'm going to limit him in a minute. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, Oni. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Paul. I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. Um, it's really, really wonderful to have you join us, uh, Anthony. And I love listening to you. I, I actually have your book uh, next to my bed. Um, but I, and I couldn't even tell you what the title is, um, because it's been sitting there for quite some time. Um, my books do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's that... Um, I my wife turns sleep. around, my wife, to, imaginal traveler, my wife turns around to me and turns around and says, I can't sleep. I'm, I'm feeling I can't sleep. Just tell me about your theories. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. And it's not that at all. It is that um, I, my whole life I've been, uh, I'm a seeker. I'm the opposite. I'm a seeker of somebody, please explain to me what my whole life of experience has been about. Somebody please define this for me so that I have words to, to, to speak and to talk about it. I think the hardest problem is an experiencer trying to reach a scientist to say, I have a lot of information to pass on to you. But when I try to put it into words, your scientific mind rejects it. I'm not saying that's you. <laughs> I think you're one of our greatest hopes here on the planet. Um, and so I, I, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say that because it's, it's been a, a life of visitors who are showing me how to, and I know you speak about the diamond and I just learned about the diamond showing me how to go within and how to make this connection with the field essentially and so mm -hmm. all I do is write and put content out there and I was speaking before uh, COVID um, in fact when I was still on Facebook I I messaged you when you posted something about I'm going to be giving a talk and I'm going to talk about Plato the alleg uh, Plato's allegory of the cave and I said, wow, what a coincidence. I'm going to give a talk too. And I, I found that to be such a great 
way to talk about these things. And the way mm-hmm. I describe this inner uh, presence that helps guide this navigator within is, is like a guide that helps us move out uh, of that um, limited view inside the cave. So I guess that's just really what, what I wanted to say and just feeling so much gratitude to be speaking with you now. You you put your you put those words together absolutely wonderfully. It was absolutely fascinating to listen to. I think you, the way you verbalised the frustrations, I think was was very true. And this is something I hear so many times. And I think probably for me, the reality is that we're all here on this earth to understand about ourselves. I think, and sometimes. And I find this frustrating. You know, there are certain groups of us and we all resonate with each other and we all we, we all feed off each other and everything else. But there's a vast majority of humanity out there really don't think the same way as we do. And I think it's because and sometimes we waste our time trying to convince those that whose minds are so closed. That and I think the danger is sorry, you're going to say. Oh, I just wanted to say. Yes, and and I did move on from that, and and it's it was so freeing. <laughs> mm, to, it is, isn't to it? Not when you, you, you give like up, I have you to think, convince. yeah, well, that's right. Because I think it was something I said earlier, and it's something a philosophy I've always followed. That even a person baying at the moon at the middle of the night has a reason for doing so. You know, for them, they are acting rationally within their own worldview. Their responses are entirely rational. They may be irrational to other people. But they're, they're reacting to the circumstances they find themselves in. And if you have extraordinary circumstances, if you have extraordinary experiences, they color the way you see the world. To help our research and understanding, leave Perceptions Today's podcast reviews, subscribe to the podcast, along with the other social media accounts and share. Come and join our live events. That way we can get together and have thoughtful discussions along with advancing our understanding of concepts as we go along.